living starting in the late 1970s. And uh, Henry George absolutely uh, had a clear analysis of uh, progress and poverty and uh, the link between the two. The first one is you mentioned that you saw these things in the 20th century, that there was so much wealth and yet so much inequality. And you mentioned land. And that made me think immediately of Henry George uh, in the 19th century. Not many people know this today, but this was a best-selling book. I think it was uh, Progress and Poverty was yeah. a book by Henri George, essentially um, concerning itself exactly with this question of how come there's so much plenty and yet so many people are still poor and inequality. And he had proposed, after surveying different ideas of his time, to tax the value, the unimproved value of the land. So whatever the land mm -hmm. is, you tax it because you know where it is. So I wanted to ask, first of all, your position on his solution and why do you think today a book that was endorsed by presidents and Leo Tolstoy and Milton Friedman and all these people has become virtually unknown today. And why do you think all of this is happening? Yeah, well, I, I would go so far as to say that I am a Georgist. You know, I first learned about Henry George through my involvement with the School of Living starting in the late 1970s. And uh, Henry George absolutely uh, had a clear analysis of uh, progress and poverty and uh, the link between the two. And uh, he realized that uh, the land ownership was becoming more and more concentrated and that in order to gain access, people had to pay rent to the landowners. Um, and so his approach uh, for solving that was to impose a land value tax. He argued that land is a commons you know, nobody created the land. It was here before us. And uh, basically land ownership has uh, evolved through a process of uh, war and confiscation and dispossession. You know, when the Europeans uh, came to uh, the American continent, uh, we basically dispossessed the people that were already here. So, you know, with... Uh, European monarchs granting uh, land ownership to uh, the, uh, the new European immigrants. Uh, that was basically uh, an outright confiscation of land from what we call the Indians or the Native Americans. So, you know, and, and there's been a, a saying that uh, behind every great fortune is a great crime. And I think that is for the most part true. And sometimes the crimes are overt, sometimes they're covert, sometimes very subtle. So yeah, we had this monopolization of land and the popular board game Monopoly was actually invented by a Georgist uh, to, to show uh, the dysfunction of uh, this land ownership pattern. That's right. Many people don't know Monopoly was invented originally by Georgist and not associated with her name, I think, but later with uh, Hasbro or whoever she sold the rights to. Parker, became... Parker Brothers eventually got it and they've made tremendous amounts of money off of it. Actually, I, I did a modified uh, Monopoly game. I called it Money Monopoly, where I tried to portray the uh, dysfunctions inherent in the money system. And uh, I've played that a few times with some people. And uh, it really does show very quickly how everything gets tied up uh, by the banking system uh, when we have to borrow money into circulation and pay interest for it. Yeah, you were talking about uh, Henry George. Well, Progress and Poverty was uh, a best-selling book uh, more than 100 years ago. And Henry George was uh, 
very influential around the world at that time. But uh, of course, what he had to say has been suppressed and, uh, and uh, not very popular by the landowning class, uh, or I might say the, uh, the elite ruling class, which now controls not only land, but also money. And I heard recently that uh, Bill Gates now owns something like 50% of all the farmland in the United States. Because he was able to accumulate tremendous amounts of monetary wealth uh, to buy that land. So, you know, we've got uh, this double monopoly of, of money and land, uh, but there are other monopolies that are uh, subsidiary to that. When you control the land and you control the money, uh, what, else? <laughs> what else is there? You can control everything. You can control the politicians, you can control uh, uh, the news media, you control the educational system. Uh, this is where we're at. So I agree with you that uh, we need to decentralize everything. I've been a decentralist uh, uh, for over 40 years because I see that our situation is the result of increasing complexity, in increasing centralization, uh, increasing concentration of wealth and power. Decentralization can help solve some of these things. But at the same time, I also feel that um, people do amass power. And so under different systems, they amass power differently. So for example, Mark Zuckerberg starts Facebook. And he starts it just like I started my companies. And then he continues to own a majority share of the voting power indefinitely. And so if he decides that Facebook should do this or that, then people really need to reason with him or try to change his mind. Without that, Facebook, a publicly traded company that has many shareholders, would still concentrate all the decision-making power in one person, let's say. Now, sometimes it's not one person. Sometimes it's a board of several people. And they sit on other boards of other companies and they sit on each other's boards. But at the end of the day, capitalism, let's say, leads to a capitalist class uh, or a, a class of people who sit on boards and make decisions about what companies will do. And sometimes those boards are beholden to the shareholders. And again, they hold a lot of shares, obviously not the shareholders that have five shares, but the shareholders have many shares. And sometimes those are pension funds and others and they represent people. But at the end of the day, the decisions are being made by the people with a lot of shares, if you will, okay? So that's capitalism. And it's essentially a system where private property, let's say, is generalized to ownership of really large things like cities and corporations, like Disney World is probably a city that's run by a corporation that is actually administered by a board that is beholden to the shareholders who don't live in Disney World, right? So, so the incentives are that people outside Disney World call the shots of what happens in Disney World. So that's capitalism. When I say socialism, I don't mean necessarily what they had in the USSR or what they had in any particular country, uh, which they call socialism or not. What I mean is that the share ownership of the organization is distributed as nearly equal per person as possible. So when I say uh, democracy, a city is democratically one person, one vote, that's what I mean, because uh, the textbook definition is collectively owning the means of production. I think means of production is a very awkward word. So let's say collectively owning the organization that you're, that's supposed to organize people. Um, so if you're collectively owning that, the idea is you can own it with shares unequally, or you can own it equally. So for example, housing cooperatives, uh, food cooperatives, uh, employee owned corporations, companies, try to distribute the voting power almost equally, even if you're a janitor, or even if you're a, a person that's been there for a few years, you don't really have that much disparity in your power. And of course there's an al analogs of that with money, but I just first wanted to talk about voting and control where do you see yourself? Do you see uh, benefits or drawbacks of 
essentially distributing power equally. And if someone tries to amass too much power, even if they started the company, like I started my company, do you feel like they therefore should own it years later when it's worth billions of dollars, like Jeff Bezos, should he get all the the decision-making power over how that money that Amazon amasses will be used or should it be done in a more democratic way? That's sort of my, how I would define that spectrum if you were, if, you know, as it were. I don't engage in ideological debates. I think that's, uh, that's uh, a futile uh, effort to, uh, to get to where we need to go. You know, different people have different ideas of what capitalism is, what socialism is. They all have attitudes about this thing bad, this thing good. Uh, I try to address the problems from the point of uh, incentives and, and structures and systems. Uh, what's wrong with the incentives that are built into the system we have today, whether you call it capitalism or or corporatism or, or whatever it is. Um, the corporate charter is actually granted by government. So that's a socialistic element in our system. It basically does that on the idea that uh, by providing the incentives uh, for people to put their capital into this particular entity, uh, people have to have the prospect of some reward. So you have a, a risk and reward situation um, and the corporate charter mm -hmm. encourages the risk mm -hmm. by creating this limited liability uh, of the structure. So if I put money into a corporation, your corporation or any corporation as a shareholder, then uh, my risk is limited to the amount of money that I've put in. It doesn't extend to my personal assets if the corporation fails or if the corporation uh, does something um, that damages the common good. So uh, this becomes uh, the main consideration. There is a social cost to limited liability because as we've seen many times in the past, if a corporation has limited liability and uh, it does something that's harmful to society, it can declare bankruptcy and basically go out of business. And those who are damaged uh, cannot uh, get uh, compensation or sufficient compensation for the damage that they have suffered. So, as I said before, uh, corporations used to be limited in what they could do, how they could do it, and how long they could do it. But all of those constraints have been removed. So those constraints that were intended uh, to protect the common good, to protect the public from uh, excessive damage uh, by corporations because of limited liability, uh, those have been obliterated. So that's the problem. So how do we create incentives for people to invest uh, without having this uh, without having this problem of uh, damage to the common good. Uh, well, when you say damage to the common good, how do you define, how would you um, define that the common good belongs to the people or the commons? Where do you draw the line? Is it a public good that's non-rivalrous and, you know, the, the, the textbook definition, I guess, like air, water? How do you determine whether the public interest was, uh, you know, affected, let's say? Well, the asbestos case might be uh, instructive in this, uh, in this question. <clears throat> asbestos was used widely uh, in the 20th century until it was discovered that it caused uh, cancer and lung problems. And then it was uh, taken off the market after 
many people had suffered uh, physical harm and disease as a result of it. But the main asbestos producers uh, went out of business and there wasn't enough money left to adequately compensate the people that were harmed. Same with tobacco. The tobacco companies knew for a long, long time that tobacco was addictive and they actually worked to make it more addictive. And uh, they covered up evidence uh, that it was harmful to people's health. I remember an ad from when I was young, more doctors smoke camels than any other brand. So you have this kind of malfeasance and uh, basically criminal activity. And very rarely are corporate executives held to account. Same thing with the uh, financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Uh, the bankers that caused this uh, crisis, <clears throat> they knowingly exploited the people that bought these uh, mortgage-backed securities. And uh, that was well told in the, the movie and the book, The Big Short. So you have all kinds of malfeasance that has gone unpublished and damage that has gone uncompensated. Uh, we still have lots of uh, corporate pollution uh, affecting, for example, uh, fisheries. The small fishermen are put out of business by pollution of the environment, the oceans in particular, or the lakes. And uh, there is no compensation for that. <laughs>